named James Guthrie. I'm a recovering drug addict. And this is my story. I was born in the Chicago area, 1987, October 27th. I was born to, you know, my parents were married at the time. A couple years later, they separated. So by the age of five, my mother had moved from the Chicago area down to Springfield, Illinois, right outside Springfield. And that's really where my story begins. My mother drank, you know, every night. You know, I can't say she was an alcoholic, but she she still drinks to this day. She can handle it, I guess you could say. She's been very productive in her life. But I didn't see my father for a couple of years, and it was rough for me. I loved my dad. I looked up to my dad. And, you know, in my childhood, I've seen a lot of stuff at a young age. I had seen domestic abuse from a woman to a man. I had seen so many things that it just, it really, my trust for women, I didn't trust women since a young age in my life because of the situation between my mother and father. And later on in life, I had to learn from it. I had to realize that it's not what it was. But So by the age of seven, um, I finally got to see my dad again. And it was rough because he had met somebody else. And it just... It was really rough for me because I looked up to him. I just wanted to be with my dad. I wanted to be that daddy's boy. So by by the age of eight, I, I really come to the conclusion that he wasn't going to be in my life. I can never get him to come to my sports games or anything. And it made me real bitter at a young age. Um, there was a situation when I was younger than that. I was about four years old. My, my father wasn't allowed to see me. And my mother's boyfriend had me. One day at the McDonald's drive through my dad walked up and told him, give me my son or I'll kill you. And my dad hid me for a couple of weeks. Um, the police showed up to get me, and that's where my re resentment at a young age came for the police for, because they took me from my father. And it was just, it was hard, you know, growing up and, and thinking about the police. I had already had resentments against them. So it was just, it was a battle since a young age to even respect the police. I was about eight when I, I had realized back to what I was saying. I was about eight when I had realized that I wasn't going to be a part of my dad's life like I wanted to be. He was traveling in and out of town. The only time I really got with him, I spent with my stepmother. I was about nine or ten. I got I got sexually assaulted as a babysitter. And it, it haunted me between the police situation, the way my parents got divorced, to the sexual assault, I was pretty much like gone in the head mentally. I didn't tell anybody because at the time I didn't fully grasp what was going on. So by the time about 10 or 11, I started hitting the street. Though that's a situation within itself to me. It wasn't like I was just new to the streets. I had grew up in poverty on and off my whole life. And I say on and off because uh, everybody in the family but my mother had money. So we always, she did her best, but we grew up in a middle class neighborhood slash low class. So at the end of the day, it was just rough. It really was. By the time I was 11, I, had, I really was intrigued by the streets. I started smoking weed. And that's really where it begins for me with the drugs. I was about 11 when I started smoking, smoking weed. By 12, 13, I was drinking. I was partying. I had a newspaper route. I was doing so many things that I should have been doing at that age. But at the end of the day, it just was what it was. I, I learned the streets. I started hustling at a young age. I had people that would coach me on what I needed to do. Some of them tried to keep me out the streets and teach me a clean hustle. Others promoted my, my drug use and promoted other things I did. But by the time I was 15, I was completely out of control. I was completely out of control. It was just, it was horrible. Um, I ran the streets, you couldn't tell me anything. I was already carrying guns at that time. I was running, I had lived up in Chicago with my father for a little bit and his family, and that went bad. So I, I was moved back with my mother down in Springfield. And by the time I came back, the summer before, before my sophomore year, I was just completely out of control. I'd been kicked out of three or four schools. I was just, man, I had a lot of issues, and I didn't get along with most kids, so I, I ran in the streets. And that's really where my love for the streets came, because if I didn't have anything else in my life, I always had the streets. So having the streets as a background, it just, it ruined me.
me in a lot of ways still to this day because that's where I got my love. That's where my family was. It was in the streets doing activities that, you know, I can't really talk about, but they just, they weren't of the right by any means. But God had his hand on me through all that. He really did. I've been in situations by 16. My mother had moved out of state and left me because she could no longer handle the situations I got myself into. Uh, my father's child support paid for the house. So I was on my own. By 16, I was I was grown in my eyes. I ran the streets by any means. I did whatever I had to do to get means of money. And I just, it was a bad time. But I had I had a girlfriend at the time, and her uncle allowed me to work at the landscape company. And that's really where my my love for plants came in and landscaping and just getting into the whole kind of trade thing at that point in time. By 17, I was, that's when I started using crystal meth. Um, I had already touched cocaine by 15. By, by the time I was 15 years old, I'll elaborate on this a little bit more. I had a pill addiction, a cocaine addiction, and I smoked weed like they were cigarettes, smoked blunts like they were cigarettes. And that was bad. You, like, when I say nobody could tell me nothing, they really couldn't. I was so intoxicated so much, and I had done so many hurtful things that I had completely pushed my family away. They wanted no pardon me. So when my mom left me at 16, I seen it coming. By 17, I was completely on my own, and I was in a whirlwind spiraling, spiraling down. But I ended up back with my father for a little while, right after I turned 18. One of my best friends died like right after my 18th birthday, three days after my 18th birthday, four days. And it was the first time I really had to deal with death like I did. Um, I had lost a couple other partners that year as well, but this was something that hit home for me. And he, he died off methadone and Xanax, the combination. And after that, that's when I was introduced to methadone and Xanax at the same time. And I tried for years while snorting powder to, to really off my stuff. I was running from who I was supposed to be. And that's the main point in my story. I realized at a young age I had a concept of God that most people don't. I learned at a young age, being in another church, I, I had different beliefs than most. And I had an understanding for Jesus Christ a lot didn't. But by the time I was running, uh, I was 18, 19, I, I was running so hard that methadone and Xanax was my intake day in and day out on top of powder, on top of weed. Uh, I had a daughter that was born, but because I had court cases, uh, CP, CPS or GCFS, they wouldn't even talk to me. They wouldn't even deal with me. They wouldn't help me out at all. I finally got to see my daughter when she was six months old, and I haven't seen her since she was nine months old. I was about 19, 20 years old. It's, it's been a long time, so I can't really reflect on that. But that was another thing that haunted me for years. I lost so much due to my addiction by then and losing my daughter my best friend went to prison i lost everything i was in such bad situations that it was just horrible it really was so I, I had to relocate again i was on the run i was facing some time i was up in i went up to a rehab facility in indianapolis indiana and that was my first treatment center i was like 22 23 years old and I learned, I learned about addiction, and I just, I was still in denial to some degree. But I still, I was on the run from Evansville, Indiana. I ended up back in Chicago with my dad for a little bit, for about 10 months, and then I ended up back with my mother um, uh, about 10 months later. I was still on the run. I went on the run for another two years. Then I called a case in 2012. They took me about three and a half years to finally get over it, and it was just a misdemeanor case, but it was just... My addiction was so out of control. I lived every day to get high. I lived every day to get money. I, I couldn't be told anything. I, I listened to certain people, but at the end of the day, I did what I wanted to do. I was reckless. I was self-centered. I was very vicious with what I did. I didn't care who I hurt. Who Whoever got hurt was just collateral damage to me. It was just part of the game. That's how it went. Well, finally, I had someone take me under their wing 2014. And when they took me under their wing in 2014, they, they showed me how to be a man. They showed me what it took to be a man. They took me out the city life. And they really, they really helped me and understand. But I was still on the run then, too. I got picked up. And when I came back, I had watched addiction just tear everybody apart. So I knew it was time for me to go back to the city. I ended up 
trying to stay clean while I was, I was actually out on bond at the time. I was trying to stay clean, but the addiction had really got a hold of me. I was drinking vinegar to cover up to pass my drug test, praying to God, praying to God. Well, that man that had helped me and taught me to be a man, he, he passed away December 2014, and it just it killed me. And I was in so many situations on the other side of the law with other people in the streets that it was dangerous. I ended up going on the run for two and a half months. I skipped bond again. I ended up turning myself in. It was like February 21st, 2015. And I went in to jail knowing that I was going to have to do all my backup time, which it was a misdemeanor. I had six months to do. It wasn't really a big deal. But I got in the drug program, and I really, I really battled in that drug program. I loved it. I wanted to be clean and sober, but my heart, my heart was somewhere else still, and I prayed about it every night. used to cry to God about, man, just deliver me, just deliver me. But I wasn't ready, and I see that now. Well, I had a chance um, when I went to court to either finish my time or I, I could take some probation. Can I go to halfway house? But I was really serious about my recovery then. I just I wasn't ready. So I went to the halfway house. I ended up making it all the way through. A situation happened. I had to leave the halfway house. I got put on a... A, heart, a wrist monitor, a heart monitor, and I was able to get my own apartment due to the situation. But it was it was critical. It was real life, man. I was into it with somebody else, beefing in the streets. It was serious. It's not something I wish upon anybody. Most of the drama I have up until this point was from the street. I had people trying to kill me throughout the Midwest. I had people that I was into it with through the certain situations because of my actions and active addiction. So when I finally made it through, you know, paper, it was like nine years, basically. I had had open cases. I got off February, or my, excuse me, I got off December 23rd, 2015. I got off paper for the first time in nine years. No open cases, no nothing. Um, and I went right back to the street. Uh, I remember as soon as I got the band cut off and I was released from probation, I went and smoked a blunt that day. So from, from then, 2015, December 23rd, up until January 1st, 2017, I was completely in the madness, the mess of addiction. There wasn't anything I wouldn't do. I tried to fight to get clean a couple of times, but at the end of the day, I just couldn't do it. Finally, the first of the year, uh, this year, 2017, January 1st, I went back to my mother's house, and I fought to get clean. But I still, I had a passion for the streets. I loved the streets. Well, my addiction was spiraled completely out of control. Three days before I got clean, I was going to go kill myself. I'd never shot dope, but I had just had enough. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I met a man, and he told me to go get on my knees at where I was located. And he told me to go find God right then and there. When he got on my knees by the vehicle I was by, and I just started screaming to God. Later on that day, throughout the day, I finally went to sleep after being up for four or five days. I, that wasn't the last time I used. I used that. That was a Friday. I used that Saturday. I used heroin for the last time Saturday, and then Easter Sunday I used I used methamphetamines for the last time. So that Monday came. I reached out to my mother and I asked her if she could help me get in a facility wherever I'd go. And this is really where my, my recovery story begins. My first day, I went to Salvation Army ARC. And I just, I've seen some people, it was similar to where I first went back when I was 22, 23 years old. It was another ARC, but it was in northern Indiana this time, in uh, Indianapolis. And I've seen a couple people I knew from back then there. And I felt like God had placed me. I finally felt God had answered my prayers. It had been a battle. I've been praying to God for months, screaming to God for months. And when I got there, I didn't realize how bad off I really was. I ended up in the hospital the next day, my day three, detox my heroin. I ended up in the hospital. And I just remember thinking that, man, like, I know God's got me. I could feel it, and I'll never forget that. So with that being said, I left rehab day seven of my recovery, and so many people just like freaked out people that love me from my active addiction people I had met from my recovery just everybody was they were going crazy and all I knew was I could trust in God I didn't know what God had in store for me but I, I went back from northern Indiana to Indianapolis that Sunday and day eight 
I started reaching out. I got a part of a couple of recovery groups on Facebook, and I just started reaching out to people in the sense where I help people get through life on life's terms. This is how God works. Eight days clean and sober. The week before, I had been on my knees screaming, crying to God, and he had me in a position to help other people. Though I may not know all the 12-step programs or anything, I know faith. I know God's love. So being able to do that and help them get through that, it was just awesome. When I went back to Indianapolis through the certain situations, I accepted I was going to get killed in my recovery because I did a lot wrong in my active addiction. And I just accepted it like, you know what, if I die, at least I'll be somebody else's inspiration to get clean. Well, God, I kept praying. I kept working my program. And my programs, for those that don't know, do know, is I accept life on life's terms. I pray about it to God, Jesus Christ, and I have faith I'll be delivered through any situation. That's my program of recovery. That... Though I'm working a 12-step program right now, that is, that's my program of recovery, is accepting prayer and faith. So by getting through that, and by getting to that point, it was just awesome, it really was. Uh, I was able, uh, by doing that, and after accepting death and recovery, God moved me to Florida, and he, he tested me in, in so many ways. Um, it was so many challenges I had to come over, come, overcome mentally and spiritually. It was just, it was amazing to see, you know, that month and a half I was in Florida, how much I had grown spiritually. And just some of the situations, I had people that constantly would talk bad to me in the halfway house. I had so many bad situations happen, but I kept my faith in God. I knew he had something for me. About two weeks ago, uh, somebody that had been following me live on my feeds, because I go live every night on my Facebook since the beginning of my recovery, came and got me. He's like a brother to me. He came and got me 2,500 miles. He traveled that weekend to come pick me up from Florida and brought me to Texas. Since I've been in Texas, I've been able to focus. And a few opportunities have opened up for me. But, I mean, I, in recovery, I didn't been through everything. It's been a war zone for me, just for work, just financially. But having faith in God, he, he finds a way. I've held signs for money in the sense where it was for a company I held a sign. I wasn't paying handling, but literally holding a sign in my recovery that's about as big as me. Then just just praying and God, God making a way. I've lived on faith my whole recovery, and a lot of people don't understand it. They're like, you can't just totally rely on God. I have to. If it wasn't for God, I would have died in active addiction. And I see, I look back on my life, and I see how God's had his hand on me. There's so many situations I should have been killed in. There's so many times I shouldn't have made it through. And I remember young, late teens, early, early 20s, praying, man, just let me make it home to my bed. It's a prayer I said so many times. And that's when I learned, when I look back in my recovery, when I was a part of this sincerity. By being sincere in prayer, God's answered me and opened doors for me that no other man can explain explain it's just been a it's been a thorough blessing in my recovery now where i'm located i'm currently working 12-step program to get through it because there's some stuff i need to get off but at the end of the day i'm not perfect but my main goal is to become a preacher there's only two things i loved in this world that was the streets and that was god and god won i told some people at the beginning of 2017 i just want to praise god and win the streets well thank god god won and he took the streets out of my life. I couldn't be more thankful for that. So I'm 91 days clean and sober today by the grace of God and the fellowship of my brothers from active addiction to recovery. I get a lot of support for what I'm doing, and I keep battling, I keep fighting. It's not easy every day, but I enjoy my recovery. I go live on my Facebook every night, and it allows other people to see that they're not the only ones struggling and suffering from what I go through. They're not the only ones that feel the pain I feel, you know, or they're not alone. It's giving hope back in recovery, and the only reason I can give hope today back in recovery is off of my faith in God. And that's what I'm saying. It's a battle, but living in active addiction was hell. It really, it was a literal hell. So being able today to be 91 days clean and sober and opportunities opening up for me all across the country and, and just being around people that really allow me to to grow and allow me to focus on my recovery to God's sin. God's really heard my prayers. But like I said, it's been a battle. It's been a war. I've been on my knees crying, screaming to God throughout my recovery. But the joy I feel today, the joy I feel today is pure. 
it's 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 not about the money today for me. It's about helping other people. And in 91 days, I'm watching God transform me every day a little bit more into where I need to be in order to help other people. And it's just a major blessing. This is my story, and I'm James Howard Guthrie the Fourth.